the Beyond Sleep Training Podcast, a podcast dedicated to sharing real tales of how people have managed sleep in their family outside of sleep training culture. Because sleep looks different with a baby in the house. And because every family is different, there is no one size fits all approach to take. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is being recorded, the Kalkadoon people. I pay my respects to the elders of this nation and the many other nations our guests reside in from the past, present and emerging. We honour Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, water and seas, as well as their rich contributions to society, including the birthing and nurturing of children. Welcome back to the Beyond Sleep Training Podcast. I'm your host, Carly Grubb, and with me today, I have Tina Ward. Tina, you're coming to us all the way from the UK, is that right? Yes, I ended up here. Excellent. And and Tina is a part of the Beyond Sleep Training Project peer support group, and she was kindly volunteered to come on the show with me after I put a bit of a call out to people who would be keen to share their experiences with us. So welcome today, Tina. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about who's in your family and how you ended up in the UK? Because it sounds like that wasn't where you were originally from. No, uh, I'm Estonian and I never really um, planned to stay, but you know how those things go. You go for a little late gap year and then you get married and have children and then you're quite happy to have to stay. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm the accidental immigrant. I am sorry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I'm quite happy here now, so I don't plan on uprooting ourselves again and I'm going anywhere. So it's me, my husband, who's Irish, and our five-year-old son and 22-month-old daughter. The second one, you don't exactly know how old they are. Yeah, she's getting close to two. She's yeah. about there. <laughs> she's about there. Lovely. Lovely. Fantastic. And so for our listeners, can you tell us, before you had your first babe, how did you think you were going to approach sleep with your family? Um, I think um, I had the usual illusions of that they sleep. I don't think I ever considered that they have to be trained to sleep. That wasn't a concept I was familiar with at all. Um, and it was talked about a lot with my first because he did not sleep. And so we were the hourly 45 minutes that that family. The little sparkler baby. And so yeah. do you think it was the, you hadn't got any of that background sleep training noise in your head. Was that because no. Estonian culture would approach sleep differently or was it um, you hadn't been around babies and really, sleep to know any of it? I hadn't really been around babies and, and I had mine quite late. So the first one I was 33 just. Um, and somehow all my friends had children back home separately. So when I went to visit, no one really talked about it that much I knew a couple of friends who did some training in that sense but I didn't pay attention to it because they weren't my babies and my brain hadn't quite switched over yet because it's surprising what having children does to your head Definitely, and it comes into it comes into your um, importance levels too. So your brain yeah. starts to register the information. So you had, so you before he was born, did you have yourself? Um, how did you set up before he arrived? I knew that I wanted him next to me. It was never a question of separating him into a separate room or anything like that. So we had the whole um, like the next to me sleeping arrangement. We had a little crib. Um, and that was my thought. We took the side down. So it was side card on. So we were in, in essence, co-sleeping, I guess, but not bed sharing. Um, and I think we, we managed that way for quite some time. And then, then sort of the health visitors and everything come into play and they say, oh, yes, you can move them into their own room when they're six months. And I think we tried stupidly. I don't know why, because he was up all the time. I have no idea what I was thinking. And uh, and my dad did look at me and say, like, a little bit early, what, what are you doing? And I was like, no, that's, that's what you're supposed to do. So it was very much what Google said at the time. And I don't think I was digging deep enough to find we never let him cry. I responded every second. He lived on top of me, kind of still does. He's five now. So it, we never trained, even though it was spoken about quite a few times as an option. So when he, when, he, 
No. So when you first had him, was he like, did you have a bit of a honeymoon period with him as a newborn or was he super wakeful yeah. from the very beginning? Yeah, we had the honeymoon period and then we had teeth at about four months, which was fun. Also, the fun part was that I thought that I would obviously stop breastfeeding a baby who has teeth. Um, no, over two years. Also something that completely changed. Um, but yeah, the sleep regression hit just with the teeth. And from then on, we went to 45 minutes, an hour and a half, the sleep cycle. It's absolutely brutal. I've been there. Uh, and I was not prepared. And we have no help. My parents are abroad. My husbands are far away. Um, my neighbors had a small child, so that kind of helped. At least I had someone to make me coffee in the morning. <laughs> it helps, doesn't it? Like yes. just little things, but it probably doesn't sound like it was enough because that is an extremely intense time. So how long did that intensity last for your babe? Um, honestly, um, we bought a house when he was about a year, 18 months, and it was still going. And by that time, I had to go to back to work full time. We had a renovation on our hands and we had a kid who woke up five times a night. Oh, brutal. <clears throat> it and wasn't was... great. No, I can imagine. And so what were your, what were you, how would you handle his wakes at this stage? What, were, what um, was working or not working? Feet to sleep. Feet to sleep every time. And uh, I, it pains me to say at some point when I tweened because I was, I wasn't functioning. Um, at all and the night weaning wasn't great my husband helped so he would console him he would hold him because as soon as he was on me the only thing he wanted was boob nothing else would even come into consideration and because I was away so much I was working five days a week full time so I fully understand why he was doing it but I understand that now looking back and it frustrated me hugely at the time and I feel so guilty about it still I, it's yeah. just I had so much on my plate that I didn't I didn't do any of the simple things I didn't have nights to myself I was painting doors or or doing something else completely irrelevant at the time but we had a house that needed to be lived in and um, I didn't take any vitamins I didn't rest I didn't sleep all of the things kind of came in together and yeah I, I should have probably read a bit more and rested a lot more isn't but it wasn't it, the option at the time. Yeah. I can look back on, on my night weaning of my first baby and I, I night weaned him um, similar, very mm. supremely wakeful person. Um, I was actually pregnant at the time uh, with oh. our second baby and the aversions were properly mm. like really getting me good. Um, and I know that I, what I did at the time certainly felt like the right thing for me and him. Mm. Um, but it's that benefit of hindsight where I actually can see that it was actually still pretty rough on him. And yeah. if I knew, if I knew a bit more about things that I know now, I probably would have approached it differently, but I really was just doing the best I could at the time. Um, yeah. and in the circumstances I found myself in, it sounds similar to you where it's like, you can look back on something and think, yeah, I'd probably do that different now. Yeah. But but that wasn't then. So I think you can give, like, we can both give ourselves some grace for that because I'm sure we were both mm. doing just the best we could at the time. And it's messy, isn't it? It's really it messy. Is. It is. And no one really prepares you for it. I think it would have been hugely different if we had a bigger community that does tell you what's normal and does remind you that you need to take care of yourself in order to take care of other little beings and things like that. And it just, it wasn't happening. And, and sometimes kind of life in. doesn't always let you do that too, isn't it? Like apart no. from having that community that facilitates that, sometimes it's just this cluster of things that come into your life and they're not always avoidable and they can make yeah. it very challenging to be able to make any other sense of it. So you can see lots of families make decisions that aren't necessarily their ideal, mm. um, but, but it was just the best yeah. that they could do at that time. And I think that's just reality. So I'm, thank you for sharing that part of your story. Mm -hmm. And so after you night weaned him, was he still very wakeful at that stage? What would you do? He was better. Him? He was better. He was and better. He would see longer stretches at that point. Um, and um, I think we just kind of muddled through. So by the time he was two, we were just, just under two, I think we were down to the evening feed 
and that was it. And he would take a bottle, so that wasn't really the main reason why I was still feeding. He was always, I could always pump and feed him a bottle or give him just basic milk by that age anyway. And I think I just, we kept going out of habit and it was nice. I didn't really find an issue with it. He, he was so happy. And especially if you're apart from each other all day, it's a yeah. beautiful way to reconnect, I think, like especially yeah. around that age group because they're still so very little really, aren't the they? They're tiny. And I don't think yeah. I really understood how fast the time would go. I think that first baby too, like it, everything seems to happen around you and you don't really have that full grasp. But I know with my second yeah. and my third baby, you you look back and think of your first baby at that age and go, wow, he was really tiny when I was expecting, you know, X, Y, Z, yeah. but yet you don't have that same context, do you? No. And funnily enough, the second one grows up significantly faster. Oh, I, I don't know. know how that's possible, but it's, it's not it fair. Just goes, <laughs> <laughs> and I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> take your time. You're fine. <laughs> you can take ages. It's like then, that with any of their things that they do, isn't it? I remember when my second, my third baby, actually, she was decided to do everything super fast. And I remember when she just started, she was rolling both ways at six weeks. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> stop. You're meant to I'm be so my down. little newborn slug for a bit longer. <laughs> it was so cute when they're that age. I know. They're beautiful. But, yeah, you're right. It absolutely seems to go into warp speed and it's very not fair when you're actually really enjoying mm -hmm. it as well. And so things he was still having his night feed uh, when he was two, uh, yeah. sleeping a bit of longer stretches. Was he still napping by day? Like how are days looking with him? Yeah, um, he would still nap in the day. He will still fall asleep before in the car in the day. He, he sleeps now. Um, I still snuggle him to sleep. He's five he was five in july and he just it's nice now it has changed from that oh my god it's gonna take me two hours to put him down or something random like that it's our reconnection time we have the books from school and just general catch-up or lego or something and i snuggle him to sleep and it takes me 10 minutes and, and then he sleeps and then he wanders in anywhere between midnight and 5 a.m lovely we all squeeze into bed together very nice and it but there's no stress around that kind of like yeah. he's still waking but it's no longer yeah. anything that impacts on on your sleep or or mm. well-being oh he'll and trick that, me in the nighttime and wake me up but it doesn't bother me anymore yeah Absolutely i think not. it's really it's so important for people who are right listening along and they're right in the trenches to know that, that this is how it progresses. Cause I think sometimes people are, are scared hearing that these older children yeah. still need some they support to sleep or that they're still waking and coming in. It, it, yeah, they're doing those things, but it's not like a negative impact on no, it's a hugely different thing. It really is. And it's and then the the needing a cuddle to sleep is actually something precious yeah. rather than anything that's like a something you'd regret because you've no, no, done no. that all his life. I've I got a couple that. of tiny regrets, but they I never left him to scream. I went and slept at the neighbor's house at some point when he was eight months old because I was losing the will to live. I just couldn't do it anymore. And my husband had him. So he took a bottle and all that kind of stuff, but there was a lot of screaming that night. It was obviously held the entire time, but I wasn't there. And now my two-year-old, nearly two-year-old, I have never left her. We have never been apart. And it's such a different thing. I can just so imagine, though, that the feelings and the um, what went into your decision to need that night away, though, when he was eight months. And it sounds like as much as you might regret it or whatever feelings you have now, it probably, once again, similar to the night weaning at the time, was probably exactly still what you needed to do with where you were at in your journey. Function. Exactly. I was at the stage where I was afraid to get up off the floor with him because I was dizzy. Yeah. I was afraid yeah. I'd fall over. I think few was people that actually, few people can relate to that level of sleep deprivation. I've been there <laughs> as well. And it's, um, it's an extraordinarily brutal experience for you mm. at, in that moment. But I think even reflecting back on it, it's hard to actually fathom what How you've been tired through. You yeah. It's, it's like the next level of fatigue, but it's, um, 
you know, at that point, you know, there's different ways different people need to handle that. And if mm. your way of being okay was to go and take that night, I'm glad that you were able to do that. And your husband was able to buffer your baby while you needed to do that. Yeah. So always like go easy on yourself there. Cause once again, like you did what you needed to do at the yeah. time. I had that luxury that I could. Thank we had no sort of daytime that. help or anything like that. And, and that was the savior. My neighbor in general, honestly, was, I think, huge help because she had a second one and she was so calm throughout just her movements of how she handled the second child, but just almost in slow motion. And she's not a slow motion kind of person, but it was hugely different when she was with her daughter. And I feel the, the same now with the second one. You are so much calmer. So I'm not sure whether the second one sleeps because I'm calmer or they're just different. I, I don't think I'll ever know. I don't think you'll ever know either, but I do, you hear people who've got their little sparklers as their second or their third baby. And it <laughs> feels like at whatever point they come into the crew, they just shake up the whole world because they're not, they're really not your average style of baby. And I think only people who've experienced that level of intensity can really understand what we're talking about for that kind yeah. of thing. But d- tell me more. I want to hear about your second baby now. So she came along. How old was your first guy? When she was um, so the first one was three and a half, and we planned it that way. Um, but the second one came early, mm. so she was two months premature. So we were in the hospital for two months. Um, things went horribly wrong with the pregnancy, and it was a, such a shock because with the first one, he went over. He was happy in there. He was not coming out, and he was always this strong really ahead, really just on it, little child. And then we had this second tiny three pound five bundle and she was really poorly in the beginning. And then because she was in the hospital for two months, I, I wasn't co-sleeping. I wasn't doing any of it, but she came out of hospital breastfed and went straight into the next to me at home. And she's you perfectly did. fine. You did so well managing to breastfeed through a two-month hospital stay. Well done, you. It was pumping. It was pumping yeah. for the start because they don't obviously feed at that age when they come out of that gestation. Um, yeah. And it was hard you work. Whoever, some, some women do that fully for the whole year or however they do it exclusively, and I don't know how. It's impressive. It. You did it, and you managed to get it to the breast as well. She, she did that one. That is impressive. Well, well. Done. well done to the two of you because that is no mean feat because, you know, like a lot of people that that experience is the, the reason that things don't necessarily work for their yeah. breastfeeding experience. So well done you. That's impressive. I've done one before, so I kind of knew what I was doing, but she figured it out, so she did really, really well. Awesome. And so you got your little love home and how was life with her then and, or life with two little people really? Lockdown. Life with two was lockdown. We came home on Sunday and the country shut down on Monday. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I'm probably the only person to say this, but I was grateful for that because there are so many complications that can come with viruses and things to all the really poorly newborns and who are early and just in general. So the whole past the baby event was cancelled, which worked really well. So we just hit and just kind of were in our little bubble. My my eldest was smitten. So he was absolutely wonderful. I don't think we've got a picture of him holding that tiny little thing. I think she was about four pound, five pound maybe when we brought her home. So oh, tiny still. Yeah. Tiny, tiny. And yeah, they they're gorgeous. That is they're so still really good. And um she slept longer stretches. She did Three hours. Um, she went through a period of the two hourly wakings, but she was never like Thomas. And uh, because obviously she, in the hospital she was timely feeds and it was she was tube fed and all that because it was was all very medical. But at home we switched to boob and it was demand feeding, as as kind of usual. And um, she did do two hourly at some point, but I don't think she ever went any more frequent than that. At least I don't remember it. Such a different because experience for you. So you hugely did you, different. Did how did you feel in your, within yourself then? Like, were you still finding you were getting periods of time where you were still very tired, or were you feeling pretty well rested? 
How did that? Um, it was okay. I think because we we had done Thomas. Yeah, as a you're family. In. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't sort of. It was always easier. It was always such a such a, much much easier than than Tommy was, and it wasn't. It was it was hard going at some point because obviously we were all locked in as well, and you get annoyed with each other. And at some point, it's it's a small house and it's four people now, and one of them still needs to be entertained. And my husband would take him for two three hour walks every single day just to kind of manage him because he's still really really active and toddlers and in then, lockdown like that's mm. you know they're toddlers whether they're in they're lockdown toddlers. or not hey it's really really intense time but it's great that your husband was able to take him out and entertain and wear him out a little bit but I was yeah. that actually brings me to relationships how did things look for you guys having I know it was a real strain on my husband and my relationship that first sparkle baby we struggled yeah. to find our feet. We struggled to find a way to work together. How was that for you guys? Yeah. It was it was a really huge learning curve. And I, I must admit, at some point I was so tired, I, I shouted at him with a voice I didn't think I could make. I wasn't sure that sound would come out of my lungs, but it was, it was horrific at some point. Um, and it also came because of the fact that I thought, well, since I'm at home with a baby, so I obviously do everything, mm. which is insane. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and he also thought because he goes to work, he needs obviously rest at night time and all the rest of it. So, so Tommy was born in July, and at Christmas time, my husband had two weeks off, so that was his holiday. Mm-hmm. And so during the holiday, we figured we're both home. We'll try and do fifty fifty. And he told me at the end of the holiday that he's now more tired than when he started, and that was us doing fifty fifty. And, and that went, kind of clicked. Yes, yes, sir. That is correct. And he is he is such a good husband and father in the sense that he really does want to try. He wants to help. He wants to be useful. And even he found it so unfathomable as to how hard this is going to be. But once you have a baby, both of your lives are going to get harder. Not just the mum. The mum isn't supposed to be some half dead gray figure that just functions like obvious yes if your husband is doing brain surgery probably he needs to have a little bit more rest than you do but most modern occupations isn't there isn't a safety issue there you can be tired well it's the same That's thing fine. it's like you're you're mothering a small human like your occupation yeah. is also dependent on you being able to function safely as yeah. well so it's that real weighing up a value of functioning isn't it and yeah. and it's it's not a competition and I think that can be very hard for couples to understand and I know for me and my husband it very much was the case though um we came to the agreement that there was no use us both being ridiculously sleep deprived mm-hmm. for the sake of us both sharing that experience what we found was that for our baby he was very much all about me during the night But that meant that dad was responsible for buffering that in the hours that he could outside of that time because, you know, he wasn't the supremely sleep deprived one and therefore he, he could step up in those ways. Um, But it wasn't, it, it didn't mean that all of his responsibilities disappeared. He still had, he still played a part in making sure that our family was okay. It's a, it's a tricky one. David did nappies and things like that. And, and still, with if you have somebody who wakes all the time, so we would try and have dinner around about six o'clock, something like that, seven. And I wouldn't be able to finish a meal for months mm-hmm. and months and months and months. He would be awake already as soon as we would put him down. He was that kind of a baby. With the second one, we didn't bother putting him any, putting her anywhere. She was just on top of me. Yeah. And it was fine. And it worked. And no bother. And if I did put her down, she'd stay there. And it's such yeah. a novelty. It's it can be so different depending on their personalities. Hey, like I know from for our family, the times that dad really owned were like while I was trying to eat my dinner, or um, I remember after I first get him down for the night because he'd do the same thing, like he'd last no time at all. But I'd mm. go have a nice long hot shower to myself. I'd finish a meal, and any yeah. waking that occurred in that time was dad's problem. And he mm-hmm. would, you know, cuddle and rock and do whatever he needed to do. But I needed that bit of protected time 
for me to be able to do my things and basic care, like being able to shower and, you know, brush my teeth with, you know, that, that kind of, it wasn't doing anything outlandish, but it was protected time. And it meant a lot to me because I knew I had it. Um, And so that was one of our times we had, and then early morning waking, that was dad's job before he went to work, any, (laughs) any early morning wake for play, that was dad. And I would sleep for a little bit longer. Was that a similar, yeah. did you guys have those kind yeah. of agreements as well? We, we still do, to be honest. Um, he takes them downstairs for breakfast and I kind of have my shower, wander down. We all go school, work, everywhere else. And it still works that way. Because I still kind of want, even though the second one self-weaned at 18 months, oh. devastated. <laughs> Absolutely devastating. How dare she? How dare she? <laughs> so I'm not I'm not a necessity anymore. She doesn't feed in the nighttime. She just wants to cuddle and she doesn't really care who cuddles her. Either of us will do. She will prefer me if she's got me in the beds, but either of us will do. So yeah, we both kind of wake up anyways. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just nice to be able to have that bit of balance. And I do think too, with the second baby the toddler, like being able to share the responsibilities too. Like we, we really needed to work as a team for bedtime mm. once that second baby had arrived and, <clears throat> and once again with the third. So I think sometimes with the first baby, it can be a bit tricky trying to find your feet, but you do eventually get your groove. Yeah. That, it was for sure. difficult to find what is it that we can and cannot do. I think we had the illusion of that we can, or we can still have dinner together. That's our, our time of day. No, no, it's not. We should have split it in hindsight, but that's hindsight for you. Yeah, well, that's it. We just started eating. Like I know with like by the time we did second and third babies, we just ate earlier. We just, as soon as our husband would be home from work, we'd eat early together as a family to make sure that everybody got a meal in. And then yeah. we'd start the, you know, the after. And so often there'd be a baby being jiggled on someone's knee <laughs> or on the boob while you're doing the one-handed dinner thing. But you kind of just figure out. And it, I guess that was something with my first. It's almost like you have to, and you have to figure out how those things practically look. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't always involve having the baby off and settled on their own. Sometimes it is yeah. actually just working around it, baby and carrier baby on knees like they're not always tidily away and it's yeah. like that's it's really that was not the illusion we had mm. Mm. exactly yes. I had the idea of they are obviously on their own somewhere yeah. by that time and that's our time and it seemed like such an intrusion and stress and and everything and it's it's not really it's a preparation it's the it's how unprepared we are for for the extra family member we don't know what that brings no or how it can look and yeah. still be okay because that's the exactly. thing, isn't it? You can have this version of how it should be or how you mm. want it to be and then it's nothing like that. But you can still be okay. you just got to figure out how to make it work for you yeah. and your family. And it's okay to grieve what you thought it yeah. would be as well because I think that's part of the process, isn't it? Getting You're allowed to go, well, this is a little bit not what I thought. I don't really like yeah. it. <laughs> but <laughs> then get on with the next part of life. Yeah, I think that that letting go took me particularly a really, really long time. I I loved my my first one. I obviously still the the obsession I had have with my children. I don't think even that outweighed the fact that um, I was slowly disappearing and I was nowhere on the food chain anymore. It was very much the last one. <laughs> I think that's your, it's part of matrescence. So I, I know you hear this from a lot of people. It's like you get completely stripped away. You lose all your sense of self, yeah. but then you find yourself again. You rebuilds, but it's a new version of you. And it's yeah. all letting, letting the things go that are never going to come back, but that's okay because what's coming yeah. forward is also going to be a beautiful thing. And I, I don't know about you, but once you get through that really awkward and messy stage of your matrescence, yep. you really come into your own again, don't you? It is, yeah. You you find that calmness and and strength in some sense. There was something really nice I read um, a while ago somewhere that giving birth is only part of the process. It's in the it's the year after the birth where you give birth to the mum, give birth to the mother inside you. Because that, I'm pretty sure, was a whole lot more painful than, <laughs> than something yes. ever was. 
It's well, you think about adolescence and all the growing yeah. pains and the angst and the awkwardness of adolescence. It's the same thing again. It's an enormous change in your yeah. body and your functions and your systems and your all your social structures. It's yeah. awkward and messy, but wow, when you come out the other side, it really is quite a beautiful thing. So for anyone in the thick of it right now, it, it will get easier. It's not always it going to feel this messy. Now, I'm just looking really at our time. Does. We're already filling up our 30 minutes, but I wouldn't want to finish without asking you, do you have a tip you'd like to share with our listeners today? Go with the flow. The usual thing that it, everyone says, but it works because they will not fit into your plan more likely than not. And there's only disappointment to be had if you really insist <laughs> on it, isn't there? I love it's all that. about the expectation. Set those really, really low and you'll be golden. That's exactly how I ended up feeling as well. It's like if I don't hold the high expectations, I can't be disappointed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's makes a world of difference. Thank you so much for coming on today, Tina. And thank you for being so honest with our listeners, because this is why we wanted to have these stories on the podcast. So people don't feel alone. They could see how the process has been for other people and they can see, feel the sense of hope that there is, that is going to be light at the end of the tunnel, especially when you're really in the thick of it. So thank you so Absolutely. much, Tina. That was fantastic. Thank you for having me. It was beautiful. Thanks for everybody listening along. And if you haven't already been able to review the show for us, if you don't mind dropping into your favorite listening platform and give us a five-star review, this is actually how podcast distribution works. The more five-star reviews and comments and things we get, the further they spread the show onto other people's platforms as well. So we really appreciate your time today if you could do that for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast today. The information we discussed was just that, information only. It is not specific advice. If you take any action following something you've heard from our show today, it is important to make sure you get professional advice about your unique situation before you proceed, whether that advice be legal, financial, accounting, medical, or any other advice. Please reach out to me if you do have any questions or if there's a topic you'd really like us to be covering. And if you know somebody who'd really benefit from listening to our podcast, please be sure to pass our name along. Also check out our free peer support group, the Beyond Sleep Training Project and our wonderful website, www.littlesparklers.org. If you'd like even more from the show, you can join us as a patron on Patreon and you can find a link for that in our show notes. If listening is not really your jam, we also make sure we put full episode transcripts on our Little Sparklers website for you to also enjoy and fully captioned YouTube videos as well on our Little Sparklers channel. So thanks again for listening today. We really enjoy bringing this 